Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming and we apologize for the slight technical issues. Uh, this is the work from home life. Uh, my name is Matthias Lippis and I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are all on today. For me, that is the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. Now, today I'm very pleased to be introducing Daria, uh, Dr. Daria Vinichkina from the University of Sydney to deliver a presentation. This is the second in the series on delivering technical training online. Uh, and Daria has recently made the jump herself from teaching largely face-to-face -to, -face to teaching online on some very technical subjects. So uh, Daria, please take it away. So hello everyone and good afternoon. My name is Daria and today I'd like to talk to you about jumping into digital. So some lessons that we learned while moving our um, in-person live coding workshops online. And I thought I'd start by giving you a little bit of an introduction to myself and to give, to give you an idea of where I'm coming from. So I'm a data scientist and professional educator at the Sydney Informatics Hub, which is a core research facility at the University of Sydney. Um, I do a lot of data consulting projects um, as part of my work, but I also run our data science training program. And it's in this latter capacity that I'm giving this talk. So, I'm also a um, carpentries instructor, mentor, maintainer, um, and instructor trainer. And really, I like to think of myself as a community organizer. So I've been really, really um, working in the past few years to try to build a community of digital skills trainer um, here in Sydney um, and in, more generally in New South Wales and Australia. And as part of that, involved been involved with events like the Research Bazaar and sort of other platforms for technical training. I'm also passionate about evidence-based teaching practices um, as they apply to upskilling researchers and other sort of tech, highly technical staff in expanding their skill sets and the types of work that they can do, which is why um, I've pursued a fellow, I'm a fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy and um, I'm also uh, a completed grad cert in higher education. So all of this is to say that I'm really comfortable doing the two things on the slides. I'm really comfortable standing in front of a room of people and guiding them through code or materials or some other kind of training. And I'm also really comfortable um, being a helper. So, and most of my classes are actually team taught where I'm working individually um, in a classroom where someone else is teaching one-on-one -on -one helping a student get through some individual roadblocks so they can participate in the class. So I've got a lot of experience doing this. So, at, um, like many of you, um, at the end of uh, last month, we were rapidly told that we were canceling all of our events and all of our training, and we're all gonna work from home now. And this was a very interesting time for us because in, internally in the program, we had just scheduled several workshops where some of my staff were gonna take on board some of the courses that I developed and start delivering them. Um, so I had a team of people who had worked hard for several weeks preparing to teach this, um, this material and literally on a Friday night we found out that the training that we had scheduled for Monday was cancelled. So instead of that I decided you know what let's try let's go on an adventure. So let's try to flip our workshops to digital and as with any other adventure the first thing that I thought of what we needed well um, let's see what the literature says let's see what's actually um, out there who's done this before and I highly recommend the following resources which I used to prepare which are Greg Wilson's excellent R Studio talks, um, Jason Bell's webinar, the previous one of this series, where he talks about he teaches digitally, and some other tips from the carpentry. So I sort of took all of that, and then I decided, so just like hiking, um, you need a map, you need a plan, you need an idea for where you're going. And in my case, that plan looks something like this, where I broke down every component of my workshops. So everything from people come in and sign in um, into a map and try to figure out how I was going to map it to digital. And in the interest of time, I don't want to talk about today, but I've written all of that up as blog posts, which you can find linked from that particular Twitter thread on this slide. So, okay, great. I've got a map. I've got a plan. I've got a team. And what we did in the team is, again, I wasn't doing this alone, um, is we started to think about how exactly we were going to do. So we started focusing on the technical stuff. So using the best microphone headset we have, which is from the RStudio talk, we spent a lot of time practicing our setup. So we played with a bunch of different webinar tools. We figured out how we were gonna set all this stuff up, what we needed to do and all these other things. 
Critically, we also made sure that we didn't assume our students would have access to multiple monitors or screens, and as it turns out rightly, because many of them didn't. So we wanted to make sure that when we were teaching, all of the things we did would be accessible to students with just one screen. And of course, as a result of all of this, we sent some really clear instructions, hopefully some clear instructions to our students and told them how to get help if something didn't work quite as planned. We also, as I said, set up our tools. So for us, our tool stack was Zoom. Uh, we reviewed pretty much every single video conferencing platform that we had access to, and we ended up with Zoom because that had the most features and sort of um, functionality that we needed. We also set up a um, shared document. In our case, we opted for Google Docs, um, which students and us could have access to at any point in time if we needed um, to either communicate with them directly, they needed to ask us the question, or post a screenshot for help. Um, we also told them what software to install. So for our case, this was, um, we were teaching introductions to machine learning. So that was either R in our studio and, and running a custom um, installation script to install some QR libraries or Anaconda Python and some Conda command line installs. And finally, we set up a, an instructor back channel where the uh, teaching team could communicate ourselves amongst each other. And it, for this, we chose a chat up on um, the chat functionality of Microsoft Teams. I'd like to emphasize here, having a back channel is really, really important. Yes, tools like Zoom um, and others will offer you a chat functionality, but usually you want a separate instructor back channel both because that allows you to communicate within that small group altogether, so all of you can see all the same chats, but also because you can be a lot less formal in your communications there, and you know, you're confident that that won't be seen by the students, because as you may or may not know, um, Zoom chats are, say, when they're saved, the private chats are also saved, so your private communication, if the students ask the chat transcripts, will be visible. So, all right, we had all of this. We also thought about, you know, how to set up um, our the visuals on a small screen, we, this is what one of the default setups of our studio plus some teaching um, materials. So Zoom is on the left, our studio is on the right, it looks like on a small screen. As you can see, it's pretty illegible. So we really had to workshop exactly how we were gonna um, teach an R. And this is sort of the final solution we ended up with, which again, uses some custom R markdown, which does add some cognitive overload, but makes it possible to teach on a screen. So again, we really workshopped how we were gonna do this um, technically. We also made sure we were prepared for Zoom, uh, which in our case would have been the internet crashes, everything goes down, and we need to communicate with our students rapidly to tell them what's going on. In our case, our platform of choice for that was Google Docs, which, um, so in addition to putting our, um, again, sort of installation instructions on there, we made sure we put links to the materials, we made sure we put like a link to the Zoom, we put all of the stuff there, um, that links to data, all of that went into the Google Docs so that students knew that it was the platform to use and a tab that they had open during the workshop so that when and if everything went down, they knew where to run. And I think the key feature for this platform has to be that it's, it's accessible on your mobile and you can just quickly pop it open, edit it with whatever resources you have, and then you're good to go. All right. So as I said, we did a lot of work, uh, prepared all of these things, and we kind of felt like this, like, hooray, we're ready for an adventure. This is going to be great. It's going to be different, but, you know, let, let's let's try this. We can do this. And that's what happened. So this is, I'm going to call this Reality Bites, the series of all the interesting things that happened during our training. So the first thing we discovered was that teaching online is really, really slow. So much more so than in-person training. And there's several reasons for this. The first is, of course, that you have to introduce all the tools you're going to use and help students set them up. But also, because you don't have a lot of the social cues that you rely on in an in-person workshop, it takes a lot longer to both explain what's happening now and for students to sort of get that. So even if we'd give the instructions, the instructions for a challenge workshop, a challenge task in the bigger group, when we'd break it out into breakout rooms, students would still need some extra guidance on exactly what they were supposed to be doing. So this really slowed us down. And it was especially slow for live coding because even though I showed you the nice two windows, like it technically worked, but some of our students even said like, I couldn't, it kept clicking on the wrong window to where I was coding versus where it was the Zoom. Like it was just that extra element of um, work. 
And yes, the Zoompocalypse is a thing. So remember I showed you how everything crashed and burned? Well, yes, it did. So for both of our workshops, Zoom literally crashed and burned and we could not access it for about um, 20 minutes. And for one of that, one of one of the cases, we basically, the team just like went out to lunch. That's it, we're just gonna have an early lunch break. For the others, we tried to jump into Microsoft Teams, which was our backup platform for students as well. And then we discovered some annoying quirks. For example, you can't see more than four people at once. So we ended up, sort of finishing that module in that time, but going back to Zoom after the lunch break um, to sort of use the richer functionality. Uh, so yep, be ready for your tool to go. And this is where the Google Doc really helped because the students knew to pop in there and they knew that that's where we were talking to them. This is an interesting one where in an in-person workshop, you kind of have your learners locked in with you in a room. So it's, they're not gonna go out for a meeting usually. They're not gonna go and you know, go do this, go do that. They're not gonna have kids and families and other responsibilities and they have to take the bread down. I think in an online workshop, we have to accept that learners will do other things. So it's much, it was much, much more common for our learners to say, I'm sorry, but I've got a meeting with my dean or my supervisor or some other critically important event. We also had learners who had children at home and I especially loved one where her child literally was climbing on her head when she was trying to learn. So that was definitely something that if we're doing a full two day workshop, like learners are going to pop out. And it, it was much harder for them to catch up as well, because while we provided access to the materials up front, um, it still wasn't the best solution because they still have to try to use the materials to catch up and then try to still follow along with what we were teaching. So it was a lot more disruptive in terms of um, workshop flow. It also was a lot harder to build connection with our learners. So one of the best features of an in-person workshop is that we actually talk to our learners and get to know them and their research and sort of their interests and skills and all of that. And we have really some really good conversations. We tried to mimic that by making sure that for both our morning and afternoon breaks, at least one, if not two instructors were always there during the break so learners could just chat to us but it still wasn't nearly as effective as it would have been had we actually all been in the same room together. So while we actually fostered it and I do it again, it was quite hard. And this is what your feedback looks like. So this is what you're, you can see of your, you can see some faces, some people might turn off, most people try to turn off video. So it's really hard to judge where your learners are. And this makes it incredibly difficult for you as a teacher to feel that your students are learning. You don't have this wonderful smiling body language, engaged, interactive feedback. So this is really, really, really um, confusing and confronting. And of course, our materials are not designed for this. They're designed to be taught in a different manner. So there, the challenges, the tasks, the way we engage with them, what we're doing, like it's not actually designed to be specific and effective for this teaching environment. In summary. My key takeaway is that it was really, really, really hard. Um, and as I said, I've been, I started this introduction with, I've been teaching for very, very many years. And this was what I found. It's really hard teaching like this. It was incredibly hard. And it was what was really good for our team is we had at least one experienced instructor in those sessions at any given time, which meant that for our more novice trainee instructors, we could tell them that it's okay that this is hard. And that I think is why you need experienced instructors teaching at the moment is to, to get people who are new to teaching or learning around, um, you know, figuring out how to engage with people learning. You don't want them to feel that this is too hard. I'm just gonna walk away, I'm a bad teacher. No, this is a very difficult teaching environment. Right, so what would I do sort of going forward? Um, the first thing is definitely ask, and we did this, make sure your um, learners turn on the videos. It's not as good feedback as in person, um, but it's definitely better than nothing. And you could Zoom's gallery view. I was just watching the gallery view. Students would see me pop my eyes up, up every time because I was actually looking at their faces and that was super helpful. Um, I think in terms of logistics, running shorter sessions would be much more effective because that would minimize the disruptions and the people needing to pop out for meetings. Because if you're gonna block off two days of people's time, I, I guarantee you that they're gonna have something else that they wanna do during those two days. So I think having um, uh, shorter sessions would be is a helpful way forward. And possibly plan for more sessions upfront than in face-to-face -face that would allow you to go at a sort of more slower pace. 
Um, something that worked well for us and that I'll continue doing was using breakout rooms and having a helper in each one to help guide the students on what exactly is happening and what they're doing, which does mean that you have need to have a decently sized teaching team. And for my math at the moment, it's N plus one to whatever you normally have for an in-person workshop. So you have an extra person who plays the role of host and sort of administers the class and also can pop out in the breakouts and guide a session. Provide access to the materials up front. So this is something that in carpentry philosophy, we sort of don't give it up front because we don't want the learners copy pasting. We really want them live coding. This is, you need the materials up front so people can look, catch up, understand, sort of have that extra access. And looking for cues of learning, which can be very subtle. Um, so again, experience with directors. So things like asking really good questions. Our learners asked a lot of great questions. Um, asking for bug fixes, even after the breaks, like after breaks, someone would come in and say, I tried running the code from last session, I got this weird error. Can you explain? Returning to multiple sessions. As I said, if you've got multiple shorter sessions, people coming back is a really great indication that they're getting more valuable learning out of it. Um, if they send you emails um, about with questions, that's great. And of course, body language of videos so that it's not perfect, but somebody who looks like really concentrating, yep, they're learning, they're trying, they're engaging with your content. But I do think that there's a different way to design online. And for me, this is about um, having shared executable code. So lots of formative assessments, which you do in breakout room. So you you don't live code, you co execute most of the code that's provided, and then you give lots and lots of individual coding tasks that are solved by students in a room. That way you actually get more of that peer learning and sort of flipped approaches. Um, because again, live coding, it, for us, it didn't work very well. We ended up about halfway switching to more like a code along where we would code and the learners would watch us and choose or not choose to live code if they felt like it. Um, Again, having a shared code document for broader review and reporting back to the wider class. So every breakout room has a separate code document and the people from the different rooms can go and look in each of the different other documents from the other groups, how the particular other group solved the problem. So that again, builds more peer learning. Probably an hour and a half to three hour long multiple sessions, possibly smaller sessions. So I know that for example, Jumping Rivers do, when they do their training online, they actually will also do um, shorter sessions are spaced across multiple days and they also will have everyone able to screen share which again um, I don't know if that's necessarily the way I do it I like a shared code document but that's again another idea again shared online lesson materials and a follow-up with either a hacky hour or other forms of support where learners after they try to apply this stuff to their own work they can then come back and sort of engage with you more but really because for us the breakout rooms and the peer learning is where the learning happened And I've been asked this as well, why not just flip it? So why not um, have some, record some videos and then have learners come in and do some tasks with you? And I think my answer to that are, is twofold. The first is the question of accessibility because even for like in-person workshops and I've done a lot of student surveys and it was because I want, I've wanted to flip my workshops. And my learners, remember adult researchers, this is not an exam, this is not a course, there's no stick of an exam that they have to do something or not get a mark. Um, they've told me repeatedly in interviews that they don't want to do any pre-work for our courses because they want to come in and learn and that's all the time they have. So flipping it means they need to invest more time in it, which some of them might do and some of them might not and then some of them will still come and try to wing it and then how do you try to teach effectively? Do you teach the ones that sort of have done the work, the ones that don't? If you're teaching a smaller group that means some people who haven't done the pre-work and can't really participate have sort of end up taking up the spot of someone who missed out who would have done so it's a really really difficult situation also in terms like right, right now specifically i don't think that it's fair to ask people to do even more work than they already are especially for people who are watching kids at home and like parents um i'm one of them so i don't have extra time to watch videos to try to go then go to a training like it's just people are time poor and i want to make our training accessible for everyone so it's my and another question is, why not make it asynchronous? And I think this is this is one where my answer is much clearer. And the re what our learners gave us feedback on was that they really valued the fact that we had spent the time sitting there in the trenches with them, battling Zoom, battling software install issues, battling whatever they needed to face to get them learning. And I think the power of having someone, even if on they're on the other side of the screen, going, I believe that you can learn this. I'm an expert in this and I want to spend my time 
sharing this with you and I want to invest in you learning it because I think you can. I don't think you can replace that with a synchronous trading. So that's why we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again because in these difficult times, being able to share with our learners our passion, our belief that they can learn this, it's just so worth it. And of course, the other interesting thing about our training was this was the first time learners explicitly in their feedback about what helped them learn highlighted our teamwork. Um, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge my team. So this is um, the two teaching teams that I worked with for machine learning in R and Python. And we really were a team. Like this teaching is, it was a great team building exercise for us. I mean, we're all work colleagues. It was really, really good for team building because we had to have each other's backs and we had to stay spot on because I'd miss a question and we would flag it to me, or it was just such a, such a team effort, much even more so than in person. And finally, I'd like to end with one of my favorite quotes uh, from Karen Ann Tomlinson, um, who's an expert on differential instruction, which is that teaching is difficult and teaching really well is profoundly difficult. And even the best among us fall short of our professional aspirations regularly and feel diminished in these moments. But yet this work for us is also nourishing. It grows us as it grows the people in our care and each success and each failure are both instructive. And as being teachers, we are challenged to become the best version of ourselves as we challenge our students to become their best as well. So, and thank you for listening to me. And now I'll pop over back to Matthias and I'd love some questions. Great, thank you very much for that, Daria. Very insightful. Uh, now, if you have not attended a GoTo webinar webinar before, there is a questions module in your control panel that you can type your questions into. Daria, I'll be reading them out for you so you don't have to wrangle them yourself. Uh, so the first question we got, uh, this happened while you were talking about learners having to drop out. Um, the question is, would you consider appointing a specific catch-up tutor whose role it is to specifically help learners catch up if they've had to drop out? So that ended up happening organically um, because, in, so our teaching team was about three, it was three people um, at like our minimum, in which case one person is delivering the content. One person is playing the role of host and actually managing all of the admin consoles, monitoring the chat, monitoring through the participants data. And that third person is actually the person doing that. So they're helpering, which in case of people popping out and coming back in, ends up being bringing them up to speed. So the answer is it's not necessarily a specific person for the entire class because we're all swapping roles, but yeah, it, it just, it happens that way. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another question, in fact, there are lots of questions coming in, uh, but we do have heaps of time, so I'm pretty confident we'll be able to get through most of them. Uh, what teacher-student ratio do you think works best online? I don't know. So I know that, so again, as I said, Jumping Rivers do online training and they have a one to 12, so one instructor and a maximum of, I think it's another um, 11 attendees. And that was also Jason's magic number. I don't know if I want to teach this alone because the cognitive overload of having to play host and teach means you want to have at least two people. Um, and my minimum is probably three. Cause again, as I just said, one's helpering, one's manager, admining, one's teaching. Um, I think a group of 15, 20, so three people to a group of 15, 20 is doable. Um, purely in the sense of you, because most of the learning in our class, like the one I really loved happened in the breakout rooms when students were talking. You want your breakout rooms to be small enough that people can still talk, which is anywhere from three to five, maybe six. Um, and you want to have, especially for these, an instructor in each of those rooms to sort of help facilitate that a little bit. So just support that. So maybe uh, three to 18, so three instructors, 18 people, but yeah, I haven't played enough with it to sort of have a magic number. Okay, well, look, it's a big time of experimentation for a lot of people. Uh, okay, next question. I think you might've actually answered this in your slides, but we'll go over it again. Uh, did you run all day courses or did you split them into half days or shorter? But we did it the way we had mapped it originally, which is two full days each. So two days for Python, two days for R. Um, I would have, again, in retrospect, I probably will do three hours a day 
max, which means the splitting a two day course into four days. Um, so that would be my, um, sorry, that one too. Yeah, so splitting a two day course into four days. So how I'm gonna manage attendance so if people miss out on a day, how they catch up. Um, again, lecture notes online and being explicit about that and see how that goes, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, another question. That was an amazing presentation, bit of feedback first. Uh, in your blog you. post, you talked about reactions and live feedbacks, uh, live feedback, sorry. Were they appropriately complementary to body language or is body language really the primary feedback line? So body language is the primary feedback. So I think, yes, I spoke about reactions. So for those that don't know Zoom, you can pop up for up to 30 seconds, like a thumbs up or a clapping in Zoom. Um, and those were used by students when we paused and said, let's say, um, are there any, uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, does most of that make sense? Things like that. And students would naturally use those reactions to pop up and go, yep, even students, especially who weren't using a video, because we had the advantage that I didn't mention is we had people attending from like Beijing, so Sydney Uni PhD students have gone back to China, they could attend and follow with our training, which again, would never be possible in person. So that was more what reactions were used for. The body language is helpful for when you're actually teaching, when you're delivering a content and you, like you're you know, introducing, let's say a random forest, and you could just see people sort of concentrating. You could see them like, especially somebody who had a camera on the their non-primary monitor, you just see them hunching over and like looking. And you don't want them to be reacting at that stage because they're trying to understand the content. You don't want them going in and popping in reactions, but you want to see that they're really focusing and concentrating. And then it makes you either slow down or speed up, but that gives you the sense that they're learning. So two different aspects of it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, oh, the questions are flooding in. Okay, um, might have to start doing some triaging, although we still do have 12 minutes left. Um, thanks, Daria, so helpful. Any tips if you just have to teach solo and can't get a team or don't have a team member to join in? So, um, of all the usual, so tick all the boxes, test your tool stack, make sure you have all the things. Uh, multiple monitors will be helpful for you, definitely, and the bigger the better, um, so that you have your sort of gallery view and sort of your admin, your Zoom hosting admin or whatever tool you're using, hosting admin on one screen and your actual, what you're teaching from on the other, that can sort of help you separate that way. Um, smaller, so small class, again, I wouldn't go beyond that, even like up to 11, I wouldn't go more. Um, and there, it also might be helpful to use um, a tool that allows screen sharing by all the students. So what more like what Jason does, where the students that have asked need help pop up their screen and share it. And then the other students help solve the student, the other the students' problems. So set up your learning that way. Um, I think that would be my, if you can, and if that fits within your course design. Um, I think, yeah, try to get peer learning happening that way and peer support because yeah, alone it's going to be challenging. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, the next question. Daria, how do you prefer to introduce your more mathematical content? Uh, do you go through the maths during the session or do you refer to an offline reference? So, um, this is more about the machine learning as itself. And the answer is we, a little bit of both. So we introduce the bare minimum that's needed to understand the coding um, and we provide links to both um, freely available online textbooks. Um, if you wanna know more about which ones like Alison Horst recently of our studio has a great blog post about a bunch of cool machine learning books online. We also showcase for both courses actually the scikit-learn documentation, which has some nice like an easy to pl find place for lots of algorithm, lots of math. And we show how to access one of the challenges for both um, courses. If we show how to understand which algorithm is actually implemented in this package we're using as an as a challenge task. So yeah, um, bare minimum in presentation and then um, hands-on discovery. Okay, great. Uh, so um, back to screen sharing, um, uh, and you, you might have covered this now already, sorry. Um, so have you been playing around much with getting trainees to share screens to the whole class for collaborative debugging? 
So I haven't because we had a higher number, so larger number of trainees plus Zoom, which allows only one person to screen share at a time. Um, so hang on a second, I need to have a look at um, my notes. I Because I know that, so there is another online platform, which is not Zoom, which is called, um, one second, uh, whereby.com. So whereby.com allows you to actually have learners share multiple all their screens at the same time. And then I think the collaborative debugging works a lot better that way. So different platform. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, limited screen space. So the, the limited screen space for two windows is a big challenge. Did you discover any tricks to helping the attendees with this? Yes, so well, two. One is an instructor trick, one is an um, attendee trick. So the instructor trick is to have, so for those of you that are my blog post, I have a photo of my setup. I actually had a Windows laptop next to all the rest of my computers purely with a small screen so I could see what the students on a small screen were seeing. And then I could adjust all my fonts and every, like a zoom of my windows specifically to make it visible on that screen, which helped me um, that way. From a student perspective, so Python is actually pretty straightforward because if you're in a Jupyter notebook, everything is kind of um, accessible. And yeah, teach from half your screen, of course. Sorry, I should have started with this. Teach from half your screen, so and tell your students to put the window on the other half. But a Jupyter notebook is actually relatively constrainable into that space. I mean, you need to add line breaks and stuff, but it works. Um, our studio is a lot harder to work with, and that's where we started using our markdown um, with inline code output. And we told, taught our students to do that as well. Again, this made it slower. This added cognitive um, overhead, which is not great. But on the flip side, it did mean that everyone could follow and do it. So um, I would do that again. Like that's the best solution I found so far. So yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, another question about helping students catch up. Uh, would you consider sharing recordings with them to catch up if they miss uh, a whole day, for example? Um, what do you think are the pros and cons to sharing recordings? So I, we actually didn't record. And we didn't record for two reasons. So the first is um, we, like as an instructor, when a video is recorded and shared, you, you lose a little bit of control about how that video later on gets used and shared and sort of, um, if you, uh, it's, you have to be very careful about sharing that with your students, but also sharing that more widely. Um, so we, I'm, again, I'm not entirely convinced that recording is necessarily a good thing to do for um, our training. It gives performance pressure on the instructor, um, and especially when you're teaching with a lot of like training or newer instructor to teaching, you you don't want that extra level of pressure. This is hard enough. Like you don't want to know that you can then go watch yourself do this on YouTube and you know reflect on oh that did they didn't say that well or I messed up this explanation. From a student perspective, it can also be a challenge because some people will not be comfortable being recorded, which means they'll either turn their video off, you don't get any feedback from them. Or they'll ask less questions, they'll be afraid of asking that. Like so many times, students are like, This is a stupid question. Like, there's no stupid questions. And the questions are really good. But because of the, the extra pressure video, I don't um, necessarily, so I don't record. Um, that might change in the future. But yeah, I just, to get my classroom dynamic a little bit easier, I've opted not to record. So yeah, okay. but on, good, online, good online course notes should replace that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and uh, so, uh, and with recordings, for example, we are recording this session, which is why I'm not reading out the names of the people asking the questions uh, in the interests of privacy. Uh, I have some feedback from somebody who has been experimenting with their own online training. They started uh, last week. And one thing that really helped in encouraging the interaction was that they divided the sessions into 25 minutes each. And every break had a poll uh, where there were multiple questions which were designed to start discussion. Uh, and this person thinks that really helped and feedback was really good about that. Um, so I, th I think that's a great idea. The problem is we're trying to teach people to code. And I don't know how you, like coding is such a technical hands-on, I need to sit at my computer and type something skill that apart from a collaborative document, I'm not sure how, you know, going in and like how you would, like, again, you can design differently. There's lots of ways you can design. 
I don't know if I, I know how to design a course that would finish in an effective amount of time. Again, my research or the researchers I train are really time poor to actually get them to a point that they could do something useful and they would have just quit halfway going, I just wanna go write my next grant. So there's lots of really cool innovations coming out from how people are teaching, but I don't know if doing frequent polling would help with um, sort of coding. Okay, great. Uh, only a couple of questions left. We've uh, plowed on through them. Um, so we have a question about using R Markdown to teach R. Uh, could you elaborate a little more on that, please? Yes. So important caveat, um, my learners are intermediate users. So this is not someone, I do not have people at, for these courses specifically that are new to R. R and Tidyverse are a prerequisite because we're teaching machine learning. So there is a certain level of expectation that they know at least, you know, some are. Uh, in practice, uh, about a, only about a third, surprisingly, are exposed to our markdown, even in our in-person classes. So that switch is not, so definitely not something that I've done easily. Um, you need to walk them through our mark, you need to walk learners through our markdown at the beginning. You need to explain the back ticks and you need to remind them that if something is doing something silly, a good thing to try is to figure out if you've forgotten to close back ticks. It's like the back tick issue is your problem. Um, other than that, like, and I don't go into any of the markdown details as well. I don't actually say, oh, you know, you can put in notes in here and you can do it. We just use it as basically an R script with inline code output. We don't actually, like we say that you can do it, but we don't add that extra cognitive overhead. Again, we're running this in our two days format. If I had more sessions, I would consider it. But yeah, so, um, and also the other thing I did mention for our studio, you minimize the other half of your pain. So all students can see is the R markdown and the console. So you don't see the rest of the, all the other fun, fun uh, features. So that allows you to teach um, effective. And I'll share my slides and you can look at my setup on that slide um, to get an idea of what I'm talking about. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, sorry, another question popped up, but we'll see how we go. We have two minutes left. Um, do you think that learners are more fragile at this time in particular? Um, I, it was an interesting experience. So I, there was definitely a lot more tolerance for all the, for the Zoompocalypse that happened. And the feedback we got, learners wrote, like, like learners were happier we were in the trenches with them than you, than I'd say usually. The fact that we braved it and tried and like we really, you know, like it didn't always work, but they, they could see that we were really, the team and I were really killing ourselves trying to get them to learn, trying to help them as much as we could. And I think that in these, like right now, it's not, it's actually not more fragile. It's they value the fact that you're willing to go above and beyond for them more. And yeah, which is again, why we'll do it again. So. Uh, yeah, I certainly find that everybody is um, taking strange disruptions in stride at the moment, whether it's technical issues or interruptions by pets or loved ones or, or what have you. Uh, so last question before we go, uh, and this is about how much content you actually managed to cover. Um, so in fact, how much or what, what proportion roughly uh, of your intended content did you manage to cover uh, in your online mode? So we actually managed to get through, probably, I'd say 95% of it, but we made one important sacrifice to do that. And that was that um, after about, I'd say three quarters of day one, instead of doing get it live coding and, and get basically forcing the learners to type with us, we said at their request, and this was again, independently from both workshops, but this was learners were like, I really want you to, they said, we don't want you to like, we're not gonna live code. We want to watch you code and narrate what you're doing. And we will ask you questions. And that was where you know, in Carpentries, we have a thing where we meet learners where they are, uh, which is about usually give the, like teach the learners the things they actually want to do. And in our case, content wise, we need to get through a lot of the material before we get to fun things like extreme gradient boosting and sort of more modern methods, um, because we spend a lot of time exploring the basics and like a linear regression. If we finish with that, our learners won't be entirely happy because that's not what they want to put in their paper. So we meeting them where they are in this case meant giving up something that is instrumental to my in-person teaching which is the live coding aspect and instead doing a code along 
Um, and I think that that's, that was the sacrifice we made. So we got through most of the content because that's what the learners wanted, um, but we had to take sh shortcuts and make difficult decisions to get there. Okay, great. Uh, that is now all of the questions. Uh, and there were certainly lots of um, uh, compliments on your presentation as well. Um, that is now all the time we have. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Daria, for giving us all of your insights. And uh, I would like to remind everybody that this session was recorded and will hopefully make the recording available uh, next week and you'll be able to share it with your networks. So thank you very much again. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.